So, uh, hello everybody, or as we say, Hare Krishna. Uh, welcome to our Sunday Bhagavatam class, the last class in the month of May, May 31st, 2020. Um, so, we are going to begin with Bhagavatam 1, 7, 22, first canto, chapter 7, text 22. This is going to be a very interesting set of verses today. <clears throat> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So, um, thank you, everyone who's watching. Arjuna Vacha, Krishna Krishna Mahabaho, Bhakta Nama Vayankara, Dame Go Dayamananam, Apavargo Si Sang Sute. Arjuna said, so <clears throat> Ashwatthama just threw his Brahmastra weapon. The Brahma weapon, Astra means a weapon, or Brahma missile. So Arjuna, uh, Ashwatthama is, of course, rationally fears for his life. Arjuna is in hot pursuit, and Ashwatthama is, is running. He was very courageous to kill sleeping young men, but now that he's facing Arjun, he's uh, a little less courageous and he's running, trying to save his life. And finally, in desperation, he throws this, uh, this Brahmastra weapon, which he does not know how to retract. In uh, these Vedic weapons, there's a technique to throw the weapon, <coughs> release the weapon, and also there's a way to pull it back. Uh, but Ashwatthama doesn't know that. So Arjuna says, Krishna, Krishna, Mahabaho. So the first line, he repeats Krishna's name, which is a, a very common way in, in, in our literature and also in real life that uh, to indicate that someone's really uh, emotional about something. At the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Sanjaya repeats many words. Uh, that uh, remembering, remembering, and uh, so uh, there are many words at the very end of Bhagavad Gita that Sangjaya repeats in ecstasy. So in Sanskrit com uh, composition, this is a common way to show that some, some someone is in a high emotional state, that they repeat words. So here he's just, he has no other shelter. Krishna, Krishna, Mahabaho, O mighty armed one. Uh, <clears throat> This is interesting also, uh, of course, Mahabaho literally means uh, one of great arms. Uh, we fight with our arms generally, of course, in, in, you know, in, in terms of fighting techniques, there are also kicks, people kick each other and things like that, but that was considered really low class. In, in this culture, Krishna conscious culture or, or this um, Barnashram culture, and to this day actually in India and in the Middle East, uh, kicking someone is, is a great insult. So unless you'd only kick someone, an opponent, if you really wanted to completely insult them. But otherwise you'd fight with your arms. So uh, so this is a very relevant name for Arjun to use here to, because he's asking Krishna, use those great arms and stop, stop this uh, lethal weapon. So he's addressing him as Mahabaho also because of the situation. Then he says, Bhaktanam Abhayankara. Abhayankara is very interesting. Uh, this word literally means uh, you who make, uh, who, who, who make uh, dangerless or fearless. Uh, Bhaya means fear or danger, and Abhaya means without danger, without fear, and so, and Kara means make that, so please, make the danger go away, make the fear go away. And uh, here it's in the vocative form, addressing Krishna as, Bhaktanam, you make the devotee's fear go away. 
Prabhupada translates Abhayankara, eradicating the fears of. So Bhaktanam, of the devotees, you eradicate or take away the fear or danger. Because uh, this, the word bhaya, often translated fear, also means danger. So tuameko, you alone, think of the word alone. You know, take off the A-L, it's just one, you all one. So eka in Sanskrit means one, and also here means alone. Tuameko, you alone, dayamananang, for those who are burning, for those who are burning, uh, Sangshriti in the last line from material existence. Uh, Sangshriti is just another form of the word Sangsara from the same root, it's just different ways to form nouns in Sanskrit from ver- verbal roots. So, uh, for those who are burning, literally, for those who are burning, you alone are apavargo, liberation. A C means you are. You alone are liberation from material existence for those who are burning. So that's literally what this verse says. And then the next verse is, Tvamadya Purushak Sakshad, you are the original. Tvamadya, you are the original. So Prabhupada translates it also. Purushak, the original person, Sakshad, in, in person. Directly, because uh, uh, aksha in Sanskrit means I. Aksha means the eye or seeing. And so sa means with, so with seeing, uh, saksha, and then in this sort of, anyway, ablative uh, adverbial form. Sakshad means that, like in person, like we can actually see you. Someone who, who is within your direct sight. In other words, they're personally there, they're directly there. So, Tomadhyak Purushak, you are the original person literally within my direct sight or directly as Prabhupada says, Ishwarak Prakite Paraha, the Lord beyond Prakriti, Prakite Paraha, uh, beyond material nature. Mayang Vyudasya Chichaktya, and literally Vyudasya casting off us means to throw or to hurl. Ud means sort of like a way. And V is, uh, you know, also distancing. So anyway, I'm not going to go into that, but I just want to let you know that in these Sanskrit words, every little <laughs> item, every little element, so here, in the, just in the verb view, dasya, you have V, Ud, Asya. Casting, uh, just casting far away. So, casting away, throwing away maya, chit-shaktya, by your conscious power, or your, by your shakti, shaktya, I won't go into all the ground here, but shaktya means by the shakti, by the power, uh, cheat of your spiritual energy, because it's interesting, the word chit can mean spiritual or uh, consciousness. Prabhupada says here, by dint of internal potency, so chit, because consciousness is the symptom of spirit, of the spiritual energy. So the word chit can mean consciousness or also spiritual. So by your conscious, conscious potency, your consciousness potency, your spiritual energy, casting away, throwing away maya, driving away maya, kaivalye in pure, Prabhupada says, in pure eternal knowledge and bliss, stita, you are situated, atmani, in your own self. Kevala, kevala means pure, exclusive, only one thing, and then from the word kevala uh, comes the word kaivalya, of course. Kaivalya simply means having the nature of kevala. Let's see if I can get you a quick definition here of kevala. It's a... uh, it's an adjective, actually, meaning exclusively one's own, not common to others, alone, only, mere, soul, excluding others. So, therefore, uh, kaivalya can mean that state where you're completely in the self and not in anything else, such as the material nature. So that's where you get this uh, 
word kaivalya from uh, from the word kevala, since it appears a lot in our books. I thought you might be interested to know where that's coming from. So kaivalya means perfect isolation, abstraction, detachment from all other connections, detachment of the soul from matter or further reincarnations. And therefore it also means impersonal liberation. Just like one of Lord Chaitanya's followers, I think it was Prabodhananda Saraswati said, Kaivalya Nidakayate, that Kaivalya is, uh, in the sense of impersonal liberation, is hellish. It's like going to hell, which I definitely agree with. So that's the word Kaivalya from the adjective Kevala. Again, it's a, it's a uh, an important word in our books, in our philosophy. So I think it's worth explaining what that word is, where it comes from. So here, Arjuna says that you are situated in Kaivalya, Kaivalya Stita Atmani. In other words, Krishna's soul, his self, Krishna's self, is exclusive. There's no one else like God. God is in his own category, sui generis. And Krishna being situated in his own infinite power and knowledge and goodness cannot be uh, uh, affected, overcome by anything else. Uh, of course, he can choose to reciprocate with us, but nothing, can, nothing has power over Krishna. And that's the idea here of the term kaivalya stita, atmani. And that kaivalya, that exclusive spiritual state, is Krishna's own self his own supreme self and of course the way you say supreme self in Sanskrit is Paramatma so uh, going to the next verse Arjun still praying here Saiva Jiva Lokasya Maya Mohita Chaita Saha Vidatsve Svena Viryena Siyo Dharmadi Lakshanam so he alone Arjuna is really he's sort of I don't want to say getting philosophical here he's a pure devotee but he's uh, he's talking about Krishna here in the third person so he's standing in front of Krishna he's begging Krishna to save him but he's it's very interesting because even, even in that state Arjuna being a pure devotee is becoming attracted to or absorbed in uh, just pure Krishna consciousness, thinking about Krishna as the absolute truth. So having glorified Krishna and begged him uh, to, uh, to be saved in the previous verse, now he's just uh, absorbed in this, you could say this meditation on Krishna. And so he uses the third person, Saiva. He alone. Jiva Lokasya Maya Mohita Chaitasa for the Jiva Loka. Jiva Lokasya for the Jiva world, the world of Jivas, the world of individual souls. Uh, Maya Mohita Chaitasa, a world whose uh, in which uh, the consciousness, Chaitas, the, the consciousness of the conditioned souls is Mohita, bewildered by Maya. So he alone. In that jiva world in which consciousness is bewildered by maya, it's a very literal translation, vidatse. And so now uh, he goes back to the second person. He's talking about he alone, but then he's saying it like it's you because he says vidatse, <coughs> which means you bestow. So if you look at these little details of the Sanskrit grammar, uh, it actually reveals a lot about Arjuna's emotional state. So he says, he alone, you, in other words, you are he alone. Like, it's almost like in English you could say, you, are, you alone are the person who did this. So you can do that in, in, in English too. You alone, or, or, you know, he alone, you know, that's you. Anyway, enough of that. So be that say, you bestow, you arrange, uh, Prabhupada says, execute. Uh, Swena viryena, by your own prowess, by your own influence, Prabhupada says. Virya, vira means a, a hero or a warrior. And so virya, virya means a heroism or in the sense of power or courage and so on. 
So Swena Viryena, by your own prowess, uh, you bestow Shreyas, you bestow well-being. Shreya in Sanskrit is actually the uh, comparative degree of the word Sri. Uh, the word Sri can mean beauty, prosperity, good fortune. And so very Sri in Sanskrit, the way you say very Sri, not just Sri, but very Sri is Shreyas. And then if you say most Sri, that's Shreshta. You, you've been reading our books, I'm sure you've heard these words. So you bestow Shreyas, which means much good fortune or well-being or greater good fortune. And this good fortune that you bestow, Lakshanam, is characterized by Dharmadi. So in Sanskrit, as you've seen, I'm sure, a million times, little hyperbole there. Um, the word Adi is a suffix. So when it comes, and, and of course Adi means the first, like Adi Purusham, Govindam Adi Purusham. Govinda, the first person or the original person. And so when you put the word Adi first, after another word, like here we have Dharmadi, it means a well-known set of things, a well-known list of things whose first member is Dharma. So what is the well-known set? What is the well-known group of things whose first member is Dharma? Well, of course, it's Dharmartha Kama Moksha. <clears throat> it's, uh, anyway, so Adi is usually translated or often translated uh, as etc. It's often translated in our books just as etc. So, not here though. So dharma, which means uh, virtue, following the rules of, as given by God. Dharma, artha, and thereby becoming prosperous or just achieving one's goals. You could say achieving one's, becoming prosperous or, or achieving uh, one's purpose in terms of material life. And then kama, and then with that prosperity, uh, one is able to satisfy the senses and finally having practiced virtue, having thereby acquired a certain level of comfort in life, and uh, having thereby satisfied one's senses, there's nothing left but then to think of one's own salvation or liberation. So dharma, dharmartha kama moksha. So it's simply abbreviated here as dharmadi, the group headed by or beginning with, the group beginning with dharma, and Lakshanam. So Lakshanam means characteristic. And uh, <clears throat> so Krishna, it's, Arjun says, Krishna, you bestow Shreyas. You bestow well-being, which is characterized by the group that begins with Dharma. That's literally what, but of course in Sanskrit, it sounds a lot more natural. It is more natural. Shreyo Dharma Adi Lakshanam. So it sounds fine in Sanskrit. It's not so analytic and broken up. So saiva jivalo kasyamaya mohita cheta saha vidhatse suena viryena seyo dharmadi lakshana. So go to the next verse. Um, Tathayam chavataras te bhuvo bhara jihirshiya swanang chananya bhavanam anudhyanaya chasakrit. So, tata, thus, or in the same way, thus, uh, ayam, this, ayam means this, tata ayam, thus, this, cha, and avatara state, uh, incarnation of yours. The word incarnation is not like the word we'd like, we'd like to use because, of course, carne in Latin means flesh, as in the disgusting preparation, chili con carne. So to incarnate literally means to in-flesh, and reincarnate is to re-in-flesh, which kind of applies to us, but not to Krishna, because he doesn't have material flesh. But anyway, Krishna's avatar, we can simply say Krishna's avatar. So similarly, thus, this avatar of yours, te, of yours, buvo bhara jihir shiya, which is, uh, with the desire to remove, uh, 
the word jihirshiya comes actually from the root her, H vowel R, from which we get the word hari, hari who takes away our suffering. So uh, that verbal root, like harati, he or she takes away. So here we have a desiderative noun formed from the verb, which means, so jihirshiya literally means with the desire to take away. So with the desire to take away para, the burden, buvo, of the earth. So this is a very common and poetic, elegant expression. Uh, buvo para, the earth's burden. Buvo para, jihir shaya. So thus, this, and, and thus, literally, and thus, this avatara of yours, with the desire to remove take away the burden of the earth, swanang chananya bhavanang. And also, another purpose of this avatara of yours is uh, so that uh, swanang, which means your own, of your own, and here it's of your own devotees, of your own, cha and, and of your own, ananya bhava, Anya means other in Sanskrit and or an other. And so an anya, an uh, means not, an anya means no other. And bhava means here sort of existence. It can be mental existence or an emotional existence as in bhava, ecstasies of devotional service or it can just be a physical existence. It just means existence. It's from the, Bhava is from the Sanskrit word bhu, which means to be or to exist. So, an anya bhava, here talking about the devotees, an anya, no other, uh, bhava anam, of, the, of those who have no other existence but you, of those who have no other feeling but for you, um, of those, and so that's what it means here. Uh, swanam, uh, for your own devotees, your own people. I mean, obviously, everyone belongs to Krishna because everyone is part of Krishna. But here, the Bhagavatam calls those who choose to recognize, to honor, to act upon that fact that we are part of God, that we are part of Krishna. Krishna reciprocates, and therefore, they're here called swanam, of Krishna's own people, his own devotees who are chananya, who are ananya bhavanam, who have no other existence but you, Krishna. They have no other existence. They ultimately they have no other existence. Their whole existence is to serve you, to just live in a relationship to you. And so for them, for those people, anudhyanaya, for to facilitate their constant meditation on you. Uh, Prabhupada translates uh, for remembering repeatedly. Uh, Sakrit, there's actually, by the, any of the Sanskrit editors, BBT, there's a mistake in the uh, translation of the last word. Asakrit uh, is not fully satisfied. That was missed by the editors. It means, um, Sakrit means one time. And asakrit means actually repeatedly. In other words, not one time or repeatedly. So uh, dhyana, dhyana means meditation, of course. And anu uh, in Sanskrit means to follow, like for example, a rupanuga, anuga, one who goes along with or following, a rupanuga. So anu means follow, but it also means follow as in the sense of the Spanish, uh, seguidamente, in other words, like one after another or continuously. So anu can also mean repeatedly, something which repeats because one follows the other. And so it can also be used that way. So anu dhyana means uh, repeating or constant or uh, meditation, that you're meditating dhyana but anu. Uh, repeatedly, one moment after another, one moment following another. So for the anudhyana, for the, for the constant or continuous 
That's another way you could translate Dhyana here. Continuous meditation of your devotees who have no other existence for their continuous meditation on you repeatedly. It's, uh, that's why you descended. That's why you came as an avatar to remove the burden of the earth, but also to give your own devotees who have no other existence to you, to you, something which they could continuously medita- meditate upon, which is exactly what we're doing right now. We're reading the Bhagavatam, and we're doing exactly what Arjun says is going to happen. And it is happening. We're doing it right now. We're remembering Krishna. We're meditating upon Krishna by hearing about these activities. And actually, Arjun knows that. Kunti also says that. In the prayers of Queen Kunti, she says people give different reasons why you came to this world but uh, sages say that you, you know, one important reason is you came so that in the future uh, your devotees could talk about you, they could have something to discuss and that's what we're doing right now so uh, the next verse Kimidang Swit Kuto Veti Deva Deva Nevediyam, so now Arjuna after these prayers, now he's Again, very intensely focused on the fact that this life-threatening missile is coming at him. Deva Deva Naved Miham Sarvato Mukamayati Teja Paramadharanam. So, Kim Idam, what is this? Just like in Latin languages, interrogative words like K, what, or quando, when, and so on. So, that comes from Sanskrit where he, question words almost always start with a K sound. So Kim, what? Or Kutra, where? Kada, when? And, uh, or or um, Katam, how? Or, uh, and so on. So the question words in Sanskrit generally start with a K. So here, Kim Idang, what is this? What is this? And uh, Swit, it's an interesting word, I actually looked that up. Uh, last night, the word swit, which is here, swid, with a, uh, with a, a swid. actually the word is swid with a D originally, but um, it's a very interesting word, it means it's a particle of inter- interrogation, asking a question or inquiry or doubt, so in Sanskrit, it's like Arjuna is saying, what is this swit, in other words, but sort of emphasizing, like, I don't know what it is. I'm really doubtful about it. Kimi dung swit. Kuto veti. Again, another question word. Kuto. From where or from what? Uh, what is this really? It's like saying, really, what is this? And 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 from what or from where is it? Where is it coming from? Deva Deva, oh God of gods. Uh, Deva Deva. Na ved me hum. I don't know. Very simple Sanskrit. Ved me. Aham, na ved me aham, aham is I. I don't know. Sarvato mukam. So the word muka, uh, of course, muka can mean face or mouth, face. And so it also means facing, like the direction that some, something, is, something is coming from. So here Arjuna says, ayati, it's coming. Sarvato mukam, from all directions. In other words, facing all directions, mukam. It's coming, uh, facing all directions. Tejak, this, this glow or this uh, sort of burning light, paramadharana, which is literally supremely frightening, dangerous. So, kimidang sutkuto veti deva deva navetnya hum sarvato mukam ayati. Teja Paramadharunam. So, let me do another verse or two. And now Krishna answers, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, Vete idam drona putrasya, Brahmam astram pradarshitam, Naiva sau veda sangharam, Pranavadha upastite. So, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, the Lord said, Veta, no, the command, you, you, know that this, know this, Veta idam, drona putrasya brahma astram, know this to be uh, the astram, the missile, the weapon, brahmam, the long a, from the Veda, because it's, it's a Vedic weapon, 
know this to be the uh, Vedic weapon of Drona's son, Drona Putrasya, Pradarshitam, which has now been revealed. Naivaso Veda Sangharam, and indeed he does not know how to retract it. Sanghara means pulling something back, retracting it. Indeed, he does not know its retraction. It's, it's you know, pulling it back. Uh, because, and, and so why did he launch it? Prana Vadha, because uh, Upasite, when this th- threat to his life came upon him, literally, when this threat to his life came upon him. Prana Vadha Upasite. So, uh, the next verse. Nahyasyanya tamang kinchit astram pratyavakarsanam jahyastrate jaunadham astra gyo hyastrate jasa. So, the poetic language, I mean, obviously, the word astra is being repeated a lot. So, uh, one second here. Yes, I, I wanted, uh, there's one word. I wanted to, uh... so, um, let's look at this verse. Nahi, indeed not, asya, uh, of this, asya means of this, mean of this weapon. Anya tamam, kinship, any other weapon at all. So this is very emphatic in Sanskrit. Indeed, of this weapon, no other weapon at all. That's kind of what it means in Sanskrit. No other weapon at all, pratyavakarsanam, can pull it back. Prati means back, and avakarsanam means to sort of pull away, pull it down. So so no other no other weapon at all can pull this weapon literally down and back. Like pull it down and back. Jahi. Therefore, since no other weapon can counteract, or even if you want to say counteract, uh, therefore, jahi, like destroy, destroy this, uh, uh, this astrateja, this, 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 the fire of this weapon, undatam, which is just expanded everywhere. Astragyo, he has strategies because you are a weapon knower. You know weapons. And uh, astra, there are different weapons. There's shastra. Actually, not shastra, scripture, but with a short A. Shastra, because shast means to cut. It's a cutting weapon. And astra, because us means to throw. Astra is a weapon that you, that you throw, like a missile. So those are the two words. A cutting weapon and a weapon that's thrown. So astra and shastra. So here, Astragyo, you know missiles, like you know the science of missiles. He indeed, so Astratejasa, so you have to, you have to destroy the fire of this missile with your own missile fire. That's basically what Krishna is saying. Destroy this missile fire with your own missile fire because you know missiles. So that's what this verse literally says. Maybe we'll do one more. Uh, actually, maybe we won't do one more. We'll stop there. So that's Krishna's instruction. Destroy this missile fire with your own missile fire because no other weapon can counteract it. So uh, there's a few questions. Is there a place for Dharmadi, for Purusharthas, in the life of a devotee by uh, dedicating them to Krishna? Or are they to be entirely rejected in favor of exclusive devotion? Very good question. And I would say the answer is they shouldn't be rejected. And I'll explain why. We should accept them. Because if you take the word dharma, virtue or doing your duty, in a Krishna conscious sense, uh, to practice bhakti yoga requires some good human qualities, such as, for example, uh, getting up on time or going to bed on time. Actually, as I, I always say, 
It's not hard to get up early. That's easy. The hard thing is going to bed early. So, uh, being disciplined in your life. Let's say if you're a devotee and you have children, you have to take care of your children. You have to work. You know, if necessary, you have to, you know, if you're not independently wealthy uh, or if you don't have a spouse that's working, you have to, but you have to, take, you have to do your duties. So even in Krishna consciousness, we do our duties for Krishna, but we have to do them. We have to be regulated. We have to keep ourselves healthy, which means get exercise. You know, we can't be gluttons. We can't just, you know, eat too much. So all these things, keeping the body healthy in various ways, doing our duty to other people, uh, our, you know, children or parents or siblings or, you know, god brothers and god sisters. Of course, we use god with all the kinship relations. You know, I guess we have god nephews, god nieces, god this, god that. But in other words, all of our... <laughs> it's kind of... Anyway, I find it kind of amusing, but... All of our relationships in Krishna consciousness, all of our duties in Krishna consciousness, duties to ourselves, to keep ourselves healthy, to keep ourselves happy in, in reasonable ways, to take care of those who depend upon us, and so on. So this is all dharma. Following the law, like paying your taxes, so you don't end up in jail or in difficulty stopping at red lights, not driving too fast, uh, so you don't endanger yourself and others. That's all dharma. So even as a devotee in Krishna consciousness, uh, uh, even as devotees, we have to behave properly. And so that's dharma. And uh, Artha, I personally found, and I have to say this, that uh, having some financial resources has been a wonderful thing in my life. For one thing, uh, I have to admit, it's given me the freedom to speak the truth as I see it. According to my best understanding, I'm able to speak the truth. According, you know, hopefully following what Krishna says and not speaking it in an offensive way. But so sometimes financial independence allows one to, in a sense, live with integrity if you don't become seduced by the money. Also, it has uh, permitted me to... Um, help other devotees when in other words if I see a situation I'd like to help perhaps not always but uh, many times I'm actually able to help and, and so uh, I'm happy about that so I'm not saying that you can't be a happy devotee unless you're unless you have money and ultimately all of us have to accept the situation Krishna put us in I mean sometimes Krishna doesn't give us money and that's best for us at the time but if we do all, all of our duties carefully and you know if we're fortunate that Krishna gives us some financial independence and then comma as far as satisfying our senses we do that also for example uh, if you have little money you can buy healthy food and you can say that's a duty that's also Dharma to keep your body healthy but also uh, you know Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita don't eat too much or too little don't sleep too much or too little. And so uh, being able to, in reasonable Krishna conscious ways, satisfy your senses is also necessary. And it's just something, again, in reasonable Krishna conscious ways, we do want to satisfy our senses. And ultimately, of course, we want liberation. Although for a devotee, liberation doesn't necessarily mean going somewhere, which we don't care about very much. As Krishna, as the Bhagavatam explains, that um, oh my God, what is that verse? The uh, Kutasjana Bibhuti, Narayana Paraksarve. Prabhupada quoted this to me actually in December of 1973. Uh, Narayana Paraksarve. All of those devotees, all you know, all of those who who take Narayan as supreme. That's what it means, Narayana Para. Para means the highest or supreme. So if you take Narayan or God, Krishna, as the most important thing in your life, then you are Narayana Para. So Narayana Paraksarve. So all of those people who have taken Krishna as the most important thing in their life, uh, all of those people, Nakutas Janabibhyati, they're not afraid of anything. Because 
Swarga Narakeshu, either Swarga in material heaven, Apavarga in liberation, or Narakeshu in, in hell. Apitul Yarta, they actually see all these things as equal. Because in all these different situations, they're just seeing Krishna. They're just seeing Krishna everywhere. So, um, so that's our liberation. If you're really Krishna conscious, if, if, if we really become pure devotees, you won't really notice that much where you are. I mean, you'll know, you'll know where you are, but because you're just seeing Krishna and you see Krishna equally everywhere and that's what you really care about. Because first of all, that's the highest pleasure. It's, it's the most amazing consciousness. And so uh, it's like, let's say you're a rich person and you're traveling. So you may travel through, let's say you're driving your car through a bad neighborhood or a good neighborhood, but you're, you know, you are in your own life. So, um, a poor neighborhood, a rich neighborhood. So anyway, going back to the question, so we do, we don't reject those things, but we reject the material version of them and we accept the Krishna conscious version. So, uh, by the way, thank you all for your kind comments. I'm not reading your kind comments to me because, you know, I have to have a little modesty, but I do appreciate it, your encouraging words. This is from Switzerland, actually. Our... Are there or were there any other monotheistic traditions or philosophical schools besides Gaudiya Vaishnavism that have a concept and understanding about the eternally and un eternality and unlimitedness of the form of God? I think you once mentioned some Greek thinker group uh, that had argued that form itself is a prerequisite of unlimitedness. Yeah, thanks for listening to all that. Yeah, so... Um, Yes, there are certain basic characteristics of God which are widely known among theistic traditions. And theistic, in other words, a personal God, tend to be the ones that have, that have become the most powerful and numerous in the world. Because for the simple reason that impersonalism really doesn't satisfy very many people and it's not even very logical. It doesn't explain very much and it doesn't satisfy us. So you get some wannabe intellectuals that are impersonalists, but among people in general that, are, any, that have any common sense, impersonalism is not something that really attracts a lot of people, thank God. So the, idea, the, the fact that God is eternal, or the form, the, the fact, what, what you find in religions is that in most religions, most people don't actually care that much about God. Uh, they just want to do a ritual, they want to, you know, guarantee their own salvation, maybe some piety, but there aren't, most people don't really stay up at night thinking about God. They just belong to religion, it gives them a certain security, it's kind of like next life insurance, and they like the piety, it's, you know, there's some happiness in, in worshiping someone greater than yourself, but most people are not into theology. However, in every religious tradition, you find mystics and theologians. And so among the people you could say in every major religion who are more serious about God and have more of an interest in understanding God, and Krishna himself says in the Bhagavad Gita, Chaturvita Vajanti Mana, the four kinds of people who approach me, and we could take this to mean in general approaching God, uh, the best are those who really are interested in God. You don't just want some material benefit, or not just curious, but they, they really care about God. They want to know God. Like in that beautiful song by George Harrison, I really want to know you. I really want to go with you. So among those people, yes, they tend to conclude, not all of them, but most of them, I would say, that God, that God has ultimately some kind of personal form, especially the mystics. Not all of them, but there are mystic traditions in, in Judaism and Christianity and Islam, such as the Sufis, and I mean, certainly Vaishnavism is all about that, and even Buddhism. You find mystic traditions, they talk about God having an eternal, unlimited form. Uh, although they don't, we have a huge advantage, and that is a, that eternal, unlimited form of God actually came to this world, and we know about it by the mercy of Prabhupada. And so, 
we go beyond mere sort of theological categories and sort of inexplicable, I can't really describe it, but it was a mystical experience that God has a form. That's nice, that's a, that's a very nice start. But Krishna consciousness goes far, far beyond that, where we actually know Krishna, we meet Krishna. He has a whole life. Before our eyes, Krishna lives a whole life and personally explains himself in the Bhagavad Gita and also speaks a lot about himself in the Bhagavatam and also other great sages speak about him. So, um, it's nice, from Switzerland. So, Spanish seal Brahmastra era inminente como es posible, I'll read it in English. If the Brahmastra was imminent, it was like really, how is it possible that Arjun had so much time <laughs> to make so many prayers? <laughs> I was actually, I noticed that as I read it. I mean, here this weapon is coming and Arjun is kind of giving us a little lesson in theology. First of all, if you actually just read the prayers through in Sanskrit, and not slowly, just kind of read them somewhat quickly, you could read all of them in, uh, you know, you can in, 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 in less than a minute. Secondly, I think we should not falsely assume, which I think it probably would be a false assumption here given the circumstances, that um, this Brahma missile is like our modern missiles where they shoot it and it just, it goes so fast. So as soon as you see it, it's, it's gonna be there like in a few seconds. Uh, not exactly. This is a different kind of technology. And so from the words, uh, sarva muto mukam ayati, and if you look closely at the Sanskrit and just focus on the, uh, the words that describe physical movement, it's, it's something else. It's not like a modern guided missile or smart missile. It's more like it's released and then this great effulgence starts to expand and, and it just starts, it, it's almost like, it's almost like a, a cloud of, uh, of fire or fiery light. I mean, I think rather than a missile shooting toward you, you have to think of a, a sort of this fiery cloud of destruction. And so if you think how a cloud would move toward you, I mean, you can't stop it, it just keeps coming and keeps coming. But you do have time to say a few things as Arjun did. So I think we have to look closely at the, at the Sanskrit words describing movement and understand how this technology is operating and what the weapon, how the weapon actually moves. Can you expand on why Kaivalya liberation is considered hellish for a devotee of Krishna? Yes, briefly. First of all, because you're not a person. I'm having a great time in life. I'm not trying to have a great time. I'm not, I'm not like, uh, I'm just trying to serve Krishna. But it's, I, I just feel, I have such a happy life. And that's just, of course, the mercy of Prabhupada and Krishna. And I'm very enthusiastic when I wake up every morning. I, uh, I can't wait to get to my service. And so if all that's taken away, I mean, the idea of not being a person, of being, I don't know about you, but I was always the type of person that, um, you know, I like to have my own life. Of course, we have to cooperate in, in groups. Sometimes we're part of committees or groups or humanity or pay our taxes and so on. So we can be socially responsible, but I love my freedom. I love my freedom and in impersonal liberation, there is no freedom because there's no you. I mean, there really is a you and that's why you eventually pop out of the Brahma Jodi. But, um, because it's artificial, but not to be a person, not to have no free will, no individuality, no personal activities, no relationships, no love, it's, it's you know, no curiosity, no anything. To me, it would be, it would be like going to hell. It would truly be like going to hell, precisely because to me, personal life, personal, free, individual life, in the service of Krishna is everything. And so for me, everything would be taken away. So yes, for me, impersonal liberation would be completely hellish, horrible. 
So the five sons that were killed were those of the five Pandavas? Yes. If so, how was Arjuna still alive? Well, his sons were killed, not him. He was in a different place. Or they were killed in the camp. They had a military camp and the five young men were sleeping and Arjuna was obviously somewhere else. And Ashwatthama knew better than to try to kill Arjuna because he just knew that would be too dangerous. So is there a breach of ISKCON science studying archaeological records from cultures mentioned in the Bhagavatam? Breach? No. First of all, uh, ISKCON science, uh, that's very interesting because I'm helping to work, I'm, I'm working with the Bhaktivedanta Institute. I'm not sure there is such a thing as ISKCON science. Uh, I think there's just science. It's like, let's say, if you, you can have an ISKCON automobile, but it if, you, if your car is running, it's running according to the normal laws of engineering and everything. It's not, there, you know, so I don't even know what ISKCON science would be. If we talk about Bhagavatam science, the Bhagavatam is giving a very different kind of science, and that's what we should understand. Uh, the Bhagavatam is giving us a, uh, a science to meditate upon. It's a science, and, and also it's it's a phenomenological science. I'll explain the difference. Um, f- uh, a phenomenon, literally, the word phenomenon means, uh, I'll read it to you, uh, a fact or situation that is observed to exist or happen. Uh, and in philosophy, it's the object of a person's perception what is the senses, what the senses or the mind notice. Like, for example, uh, so the world that you can actually experience, the world that you can directly experience with your senses and mind, that is the phenomenal world. So, um, because the world is teleological, I'll try to explain this simply, because the world is teleological, in other words, it has a purpose. It was, it, it was made intentionally. To give you an example of another teleological thing, from the Greek word telos, purpose, uh, something that was made intentionally, let's say a painting. A painting. People intentionally paint pictures. Modern art, uh, anyway, I don't know what that is. I, it's certainly not art, but whatever it is. So, but let's say people that actually do art don't just put you know, like black dots on a canvas or something. So if someone, sorry, I really have a problem with modern art. But so if you say a painting, you know, good art, something where someone actually knows how to paint and, and they paint a picture, they painted that picture to be seen. It, there's a purpose. Someone painted a picture or designed a building architecture or let's say composed music. Let's give a different example. Let's say someone composed music. Let's take Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach, who was uh, obviously a genius composer. So he composed his music to be heard. It was meant to be heard by human beings. And so therefore, it's teleological. So you could talk about all the math, of, and some people are interested in that, or you could talk about, let's say, if, if you're a sound technician, you could talk about that, or if you, there's all kinds of different ways you could get at the music. You could just talk about it scientifically as sound. But ultimately, the people who, but Bach wasn't just trying to make physical sound just for the sake of science, or someone's not just painting a picture uh, just because they're into paint chemicals. They're trying to say something visually or through sound. And so therefore, if you, if you look at that painting, let's say you're an art historian and you really understand that painting, then you've understood the author's purpose. If you listen to Bach's music and you're not just a sound technician and you understand what Bach meant or what, he, or what he's trying to say, then, and you enjoy the music, then you are experiencing what the composer wanted you to experience. So in the same way, when the supreme artist is Krishna, so when you look up at the blue sky or see white clouds in a blue sky and you admire it, it is beautiful actually, then when you see the blue sky, 
you are seeing the sky as the artist wanted you to see it. So when some uh, basically unintelligent scientist, and some of them are intelligent, a lot of them philosophically are, uh, have, have, are totally clueless. When someone comes along and says, well, the sky's not really blue, my point is, yeah, it is really blue. Because you can say, you know, scientifically, the optic nerve and this and that and technically and blah, blah, blah. But the point is, an artist made the world so that we would see a blue sky. Just as someone who understands all about the chemistry of paint, oil paint, is not the person, I would say, who really understands a great work of of art. It's, it's the person who understands the art as art. And so that's phenomenology. Phenomenology means that to really, at least in, you could say Krishna conscious phenomenology means that to really understand this world is to understand the purpose and the artistry of the person who made it. And you can go behind the scenes, so to speak, and look at all the, the wires and all of the electronics and the engineering of the universe, as science does, but that's all it is. It's like when I see a movie, let's say if I see a movie, uh, I'm into the movie. Now, it's a fact, there's a huge amount of technology behind that movie, of science. There's digital technology, and there's just, there's all kinds of things. You know, nowadays, especially movies are very technically sophisticated all of which I appreciate and all of which, and, and that's it. I, I, I personally have no interest in that. Some people do and that's good and, and that's fine. But personally, I can enjoy a movie and get out of it whatever I wanted and I really have no curiosity about the technical part of it. And the person that made the movie is made it so that I would have that experience. That's the purpose of it. It's not technology for its own sake. It's not electronics for its own sake. It's not even acting for its own sake. It's actually all of those things together to fulfill the purpose of the movie, which is that you watch it and you have an experience. The experience, the phenomenological experience, the experience you have with your normal senses, that's the whole purpose of it. And therefore, to understand the purpose of something, and to experience it the way it is meant to be experienced, ultimately, is to understand it. And therefore, when someone says, a scientist says, well, uh, you know, we used to wonder why the sky is blue, and now we know why the sky, no, you don't know why the sky is blue. You know how it's blue, but you don't know why it's blue. As a scientist, you may know why it's blue as a pious human being, because God made it blue. That's his art. And so therefore, uh, the Bhagavatam, now the reason I went through all this is that the Bhagavatam is giving us phenomenological science. In other words, it's giving us just a way to meditate on the universe as the creation of God. The Bhagavatam is helping us to understand the world phenomenologically, whereas the whole purpose of, let's say, Western science, or just science now, is to give us an explanation of the engineering that will allow us to manipulate the world. The Bhagavatam is not trying to help you to manipulate the world, but rather to appreciate it, to appreciate it. So appreciating the world requires a different knowledge sometimes than the knowledge you need to manipulate it. And so some people say, well, the Bhagavatam science is not really science because it doesn't help us to exploit and manipulate the world, but that's not what the Bhagavatam is interested in. So that's why there are these two different kinds of science. And thank you for the question. Thank you all for listening. I always appreciate that you're here. It's uh, a little lonely to give the Bhagavatam class by myself, so it's nice you're all there. And uh, I hope you'll be back with us next Sunday and that we'll all be here together okay Hare Krishna